Damn it, how long have we been doing this show? The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life, it's episode 370, it is the second week of April of 2024, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week, and so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. Another WrestleMania in the books. <laughs> it's officially now our uh, our 10th anniversary. How about that? Yeah, we did our first uh, full real show uh, immediately following WrestleMania in 2014. And uh, boy, howdy. Like second episode in, we had to talk about the Ultimate Warrior dying. Yeah, he sure did. Well, now it's a new era. So I've heard. Vince McMahon fell down an elevator shaft onto some bullets. <laughs> <laughs> and we're now in the Paul Levesque era of WWE. He is a happily married man. <laughs> For sure. 100%. Loves his wife and kids. Mm-hmm. Sees them frequently. All the time. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So, uh, WrestleMania is in the books. Cody finished his story. WWE told us repeatedly that this is a new era. Mm-hmm. And one that we should credit Triple H for. <laughs> Triple H, the uh, showrunner for WWE, <laughs> the premium live events, Raw, SmackDown, uh, scripted multiple segments this week <laughs> where uh, where uh, people were praising Paul Levesque. Really, Cody finishing his story should be the over arching theme and like the most successful Wrestlemania of all time and WWE is in the middle of a new boom period and all I can think about is Triple H doing it all shucks in the ring as the crowd chants his name uh huh what do you think about uh, Wrestlemania in general we'll talk matches specifically in a second here and mm-hmm. uh, about this new era the Paul Levesque era uh yeah I mean as far as the shows themselves I thought they were pretty with the exception of the the big stars that we had, like Dwayne Johnson and some of the other cameos, like you said, we'll talk matches in a minute. Uh, felt like pretty standard WWE big stadium show pay per view. Uh, there were a lot of ads, and there was a giant crowd. Crowd looked amazing. Stage looked good. I liked that they went with kind of a minimalist the uh, stage this year. Um. And uh, yeah, production values second to none. Uh, yeah, I thought it was, uh, and it's funny because I didn't, I did not get to watch night two live, um, but I watched it Sunday morning, and I had seen a lot of tweets of people just dogging that show, and I thought it was fine per WWE standards. <laughs> uh, and then yeah, sun- Sunday was fine too. So yeah, it was good. And then there was a lot, as you mentioned, from from the Hall of Fame to uh, WrestleMania to the night after on Raw. There's just a whole lot of let's congratulate uh, the brilliant mind of Paul Levesque, the beautiful mind of Paul Levesque uh, for for gifting us with this wonderful uh, WWE, which is uh, distinct in specific and uh, easily describable ways than the old WWE. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Night one, WrestleMania. We kicked off WrestleMania. Rhea Ripley beating Becky Lynch. Mm -hmm. This could have played like a farewell for Becky Lynch if you wanted it to. They did a like a career retrospective for her. Uh, incidentally, I don't think she's going anywhere. I uh, I think her and uh, Seth freaking Rollins are uh, going going to be there for many many years to come. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, Rhea, Rhea beat Becky. Uh, they were trying. 
they were um I thought they were fighting uh uh the I thought they were fighting the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> crowd liked doesn't want to boo Rhea. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Well, I don't trust the crowd's intentions with Rhea either. <laughs> Um, Who, whose intentions like uh, which women do you do you trust the intentions of the crowd on um let's see off the top of my head <laughs> i'm drawing a blank fair enough i was mentally going through the <laughs> roster in my head <laughs> let's see uh uh let's just... Yeah, I don't I don't trust the I don't trust the audience. <laughs> I don't trust wrestling fans in general. No. No. Um they split the raw and tag titles as it seemed they were going to. Mm-hmm. Uh in a ladder match that I've already forgotten. <laughs> the LWO and Andrade. Andrade got himself into a WrestleMania match at the expense mm-hmm. of Dragon Lee. The very last second. <laughs> yeah. And the night before, um, and they beat uh, the uh, Legato and uh, the Legato and Dominic team. Uh, Jay Uso beat Jimmy Uso. Not, none, none of his stuff got a lot of time. I, 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 they have unlimited time. They started at seven p.m. Mm-hmm. The show ended at like eleven twenty on. Saturday night, and uh, Rey Mysterio got, got eleven minutes. Jey Uso got eleven minutes. <laughs> like, I mean, I would have cut time off that J match. Personally. Honestly, it, it's a it's a seven match show. What? Do, why do we have to cut any time? <laughs> Other than we have to do well, a long plugs for Turbo Tax or whatever. I mean. Well, that's yeah, that's the real answer. My I was attempting to make a joke because I didn't like the Jey Uso match. And so I was just wishing it was shorter than it I already think, was. I think you called it the, possibly the worst match in WrestleMania history. Right. Which is probably a bit extreme, but uh, it's it's the most recent WrestleMania match I can remember hating. So sure. Um, yeah, it wasn't good. It was everything that I. Just dis- dislike about modern wwe in ring wrestling and that it was guys who would they would hit a move and then they wouldn't talk and then they would pose and then they would hit another move my favorite part is when jay hits a hits a move and jimmy is in the corner looking at him and jay looks at his twin brother and shouts i'm your twin brother that was really that was really compelling uh uh generational cinema uh, being being put on display there. Um, these guys are not singles wrestlers, and they shouldn't be singles wrestlers. And you should put them back together yesterday. Well, Jey Uso is now the number one contender to Damian Priest on uh, Raw for the world title, and Jimmy Uso really could have used a win here, particularly if you're just going to do a number one contenders match. On Raw, and anyone could have won it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jimmy uh, really could use the win to maybe heat somebody up for Cody, even if it's just for Cody to beat around the loop. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, he lost. That's fine. You know, <laughs> this is the, like the most successful WrestleMania ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're in the midst of what is it, like 18 straight sell house now. Yeah. Yeah. It's legitimately. You can argue it's a new it's a new boom period. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, they, they haven't had one of those in 25 years. Right. <laughs> what they're doing right now is more successful than anything they have done since like the year 2000. Yes. Unreal. Uh, Jay Cargill uh, made her WrestleMania debut, teaming with uh, Bianca and Naomi to defeat Damage Control. Uh, eight minutes, not a lot to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not good, not bad. Uh, Sami Zayn beat Gunther to win the Intercontinental Championship. Uh, really good. Yeah. 
yeah, it was it was good, and there was no Gaga or Chad Gable getting involved or anything. Good wrestling match. Sammy took all the punishment, came back and won. Uh, really good, simple stuff and minimal monologuing and uh, posing between uh, the big moves. Uh, Sammy's uh, Canadian wife, uh, yeah. just cute as a button. Uh huh. Yeah, that was a really sweet. They had a really sweet. Uh, that whole pre- presentation was was great. From the it's him and his wife and kid backstage. And then they follow him all the way through the tunnel and going up the ramp. And then he sees Kevin Owens and they hug and he gets all fired up and he does his entrance. And then just his wife is at ringside because uh, they didn't want his son to see him get uh, get chopped all over the place, I guess. Good. Yeah, probably for the best. You don't need to see. Keep your, kids out of this business. Your dad. Yeah, you don't need to see your dad uh, turn into hamburger, get his chest turned into hamburger meat. So. Uh, and then he won. He got a great babyface uh, win, and it was just yeah, it was good. It's time for Gunther to move on to to bigger and better things. And Sammy's never winning the world title, so this was a nice, you know, a, a marquee singles win at WrestleMania and ending this, you know, record breaking title reign. So good stuff. And uh, then yes, on night one, um, the Bloodline beat Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. Well, there we go. <laughs> and we're off to the races. Mm-hmm. Cody and the Rock story has just begun uh, because the Rock pinned Cody Rhodes. Mm-hmm. No, uh, no solo or Jimmy. Like there was brawling and bending of rules. Yes. But no, uh, no out and out run ins or, or anything. Just, uh, yep. Rome hit the spear, Rock hit the people's elbow. And Rock pinned him. So, which for where they're going makes sense. So I didn't, I never problem with it. I had a problem with it going forty five minutes, but uh, well, you know, the rock, the rock needed a break to get to uh, hydrate himself. <laughs> he was literally pour, drinking water and pouring water all over himself. Hey, whatever you're gonna do, sure. Uh, rock um had had some acne on his back. Mm-hmm. And has a little bit of a belly pooch, which tends to happen if uh, you have abused uh, human growth hormone over the years, as our friend uh, the Icon Stinky taught me many years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Rock could hide his uh, little uh, HGH p- pooch uh, by pulling up his speedo. Randy Orton on um, the next night's show <laughs> lo- looked visibly pregnant. <laughs> Uh, but uh, hey, Rock didn't tear every muscle in his body. Apparently, came out of the match healthy, and uh, and uh, we'll get to where they're going down the road here in a second. We'll power through night two here. Drew McIntyre beat Seth Rollins with a title. Ten minutes, not a whole lot to it. Seth, a geek this weekend. He lost on night one. He lost on night two. He got punked out at the end of night two, mm-hmm. and now he's taking a month off. Uh, I wouldn't read anything into it. I think maybe he comes back as a heel, though, and uh, that could be uh, what long overdue. Sure. I don't know. You could move him to SmackDown. Uh, yeah, there's a draft coming up now. Yeah. Beat yeah. him on his way out of the territory, and then move him to the other show. <laughs> Stupid. Like, like, Stupid like Vince ever. always did. Yes. Except uh. for Triple H. Who always won when he was moving shows, but yes, everybody else lost on their way to Raw or SmackDown. Damian Priest then cashed in and beat Drew McIntyre, who Fightful swears has not signed a new contract as of yet. Mm-hmm. I think with all of these folks, Drew McIntyre, Seth Rollins, Becky Lynch, all these people that have allegedly not signed contracts yet, I feel like we're just I feel like there's just semantics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like there's an agreement that all of those folks aren't going anywhere. Otherwise, why would you invest all of the television time that you've invested in them <laughs> over the last several months? Yeah, it would be it would be an insane thing to do. <laughs> um, I yeah, I believe this in the same way I believe uh when Punk told the story about how he signed his extension in 2011 during the Money in the Bank show. 
Right. Like I believe like letter of the law, you put pen to paper on the final thing that day. Right. But no, I don't believe that like you were, you didn't know if you were going to resign going into that day. (laughs) Right. One thing we know about Phil, (laughs) CM Punk never bends the truth. It's a, it's a family guy. It's true. Good family man. Took a lot of pictures this weekend. Didn't see his Uh, wife in any of them, but I'm sure that's, she was just out of frame. Also, I, I saw a lot of women. And uh, and the Miz in mm-hmm. photos with CM Punk this weekend. Is he <laughs> is he just walking the halls, flirting with every woman, <laughs> and taking photos with them? Uh, and also the Miz. <laughs> also the Miz. Uh, one could certainly uh, get that impression if you looked at the photos around uh, social media i don't know maybe everyone's coming up to him and just asking him for a photo and you know he's such an accommodating nice guy that he's just uh you know the people love him great locker room presence uh in wwe so maybe 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 people are all coming up to him we we just don't know <laughs> we're gonna get into uh, uh phil's locker room presence of course obviously later in this program <laughs> Uh, continuing on night two of WrestleMania. Hey, Damian Priest is the world champion now. What do you think of that? I mean, who cares about that belt, right? <laughs> like, it's fine. I I feel like the Money in the Bank uh, contract ran out of steam about like eight years ago. Sure. But so... they stopped using it to make new stars. Correct. <laughs> Technically, I guess you could say 41 year old Damian Priest is a new star. <laughs> He's never been pushed to this level before. He's only like four in TV years. Right. So um, I don't know. Again, it'll depend. They tr- really tried to make it seem like this Seth run that he had of this workhorse title was like a real serious epic run. And it's just nobody. I just everybody knows the real belt is the one that Cody has. And the second most important belt is apparently the belt that <laughs> Dwayne had Muhammad Ali's wife give him. So now it's like the third place belt. <laughs> sure. Um, the Pride beats the Final Testament in a Philadelphia street fight where Bubba Ray Dudley got himself a special guest referee spot. And uh, Carrying Cross is now relegated to selling uh, his balls for comedy spots with Bubba Ray Dudley. He's already on like his second reboot of his second main roster run. And now he's the guy who sells his balls so Bubba Ray Dudley can do what's up. <laughs> I'm I'm fine. I mean, I I prefer not to see Bubba Ray Dudley at all. But I mean, given the given the circumstances, it was fine. And uh, Snoop Dogg was very entertaining on commentary during this match. So there was that. That was the best part of the match. It it was an Art Donovan, but it's probably the second best celebrity uh, <laughs> color commentary appearance of all time. Agreed. LA Knight beat uh, AJ Styles. Not a whole lot to say here. <laughs> Another heel that we hypothesized could use a win to set him up to work with a baby faced world champion. And they chose not to do that. Gave uh, LA Knight a big WrestleMania win instead. I, I'm not complaining about all the baby face wins on these shows. <laughs> oh, no. Given the choice. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd much prefer a, a and it's rest, traditionally WrestleMania was always a babyface win heavy show. It just hasn't been that way in like more than a decade, I guess. So I just was caught off guard by how many uh, baby faces won up and down this card. We decided to we start sending our fans home angry every year. <laughs> <laughs> we decided we we're gonna trick them. <laughs> That's what you want after paying $1,200 <laughs> to sit two miles from the ring. Um, watch, the entire, pole. watch the entire thing on a giant screen. Yeah. yeah. At, at the end of that, you just want to be furious when you're leaving. Sit in traffic for an hour and a half trying to get mm-hmm. out of the parking lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Trying to get an Uber. Yep. Ugh. Uh, one, one heel that did win was Logan Paul. He kept his United States title. In a three-way over uh, Kevin Owens or Randy Orton. I guess we just always need to have a champion who's never around. 
<laughs> so so Logan Paul kept the United States title. Uh fun little three way. And uh, we as we mentioned, Randy Orton looked actively pregnant. <laughs> Big boy. Big boy. Not a lot going on. He gave an RKO to yet another person who was in the prime bottle costume that I have never heard of because I'm 31 and the world has passed me by. Someone known as I show speed. Mm -hmm. I believe he's a Twitch streamer, but that's only a guess. He is a, an American YouTuber and rapper best oh. known for his live streams in which he primarily plays video games, okay. including FIFA Fortnite and Roblox. Okay, big three. Uh, FIFA doesn't exist anymore. It's uh, now EAFC, by the mm -hmm, way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Bailey, our friend Pam, uh, beat EO Sky to win the WWE Women's Championship. So uh, the girlhood dream has come true for <laughs> uh, our pal Pam. Mm -hmm. fun, ma fun match. Yeah, uh, good. It wasn't, again, you talked about the timing of everything. They were not given the time to have like epic 25 near falls WrestleMania main event match, but it was good. And there's EO did a counter to Pam's bad finisher that I thought was like the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so, you know, this guy's really good at pro wrestling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Bailey's really good at pro wrestling. Main event of night two, Cody Rhodes beat Roman Reigns. Uh, we got the Avengers spot where uh, the Rock is uh, trying to screw uh, Cody and uh, the Undertaker and uh, John Cena tries to make the save, gets laid out like a geek. <laughs> uh, the Undertaker makes the save and uh, takes the Rock out. And uh, the only problem with that is that for a minute, the match you thought they were building to was was the Undertaker versus the Rock. Uh, then Body show in May. There's still time. True. Then Seth Rollins appears uh, with shield music. And uh, for 30 seconds, there was a part of me. I am ashamed to admit that thought. <laughs> I think John Moxley might be walking down the ramp here. <laughs> and would have been uh, wild. <laughs> would have been wild. We know he has not always been under contract. <laughs> True. <laughs> the entire time he's been on TV with AEW. I am ashamed that I was such a rube that I thought this was <laughs> a possibility for a second. Uh, Seth Rollins came out dressed in his shield gear and uh, they did a call back to the uh, Seth turning on the shield spot from 10 years ago, mm -hmm. except they had a Roman hit Seth with the chair this time. Anyway, all of this interference allowed Cody to win the title. Uh, what'd you think? Um, I, I mean, once all the run-ins got there and we, it was just nothing but Gaga. It was a lot of fun. It's that type of goofy run in filled, uh, thing that only WWE is good at doing um, and it was great and it was fun and it was hilarious when Seth ran in got punched out immediately and then like a minute later tried to stand up and got hit with the chair uh, and then every, and then I saw the, the lore masters on uh, on social media being like well you see he was actually doing this because he said he would be Cody's shield. And so he was yes. giving himself willingly to uh, to let... I was, I was like, oh, he let Roman kick his... Why didn't he just kick Roman's ass? His only solution to help Cody win was to allow himself to get his ass kicked, apparently. You know, it's just over my head. You know, I don't appreciate the cinema, uh, I guess. But uh, regardless, yes, that was funny. The Taker... Taker got a giant reaction, and it was funny, and it was fun in the moment. It was immediately clear, and I think I messaged you immediately and was like, oh, so Austin said no. <laughs> and this was the backup plan. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Undertaker, um, not one to turn down a payday. Mm -mm. He's got... No. He's got... I don't know. I have no idea how many children he has. I think he just has 
Um, one older child, one grown up child, and one young child. I okay. think that sounds right. Now I have to look this up. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, you can keep talking. Yes, but regardless, uh, Mean Mark is never one to pass up a a payday, and but he, I think his days of uh his days of getting in full gimmick are done. <laughs> So he came out in his hoodie and his his little his little beanie, and uh, and gave the choke slam, which was it was like I said, it was fun. It was immediately clear to me that Steve Austin told them no, and that they didn't have, I guess, anybody else in town that they thought would uh, mean as much. But it was uh, it was fun spot, and at the end, it came down to Cody and Roman, and Cody hits the crossroads and beats and beats him. And so you got your big happy ending at the end. So yeah, the the first like 25 minutes of the match were mildly irritating to me because we all knew we were waiting for the run-ins. Right. And it's no DQ and The Rock is in charge of the company and could do whatever he wants, which is why he could basically work it like it was a no DQ match the night before. And yet they waited and then ran out like one at a time <laughs> to uh, to like, OK, Jimmy ran out, then Jay ran out, took him out, then Solo ran out, then Cena ran out, then The Rock finally waltzed out there and then The Undertaker came out. So it just felt like, well, heel, heels could be dumb. So like it's less of an issue when the heels look it, like idiots. But it's still something that should probably be explained or should have been explained at some point as to why they waited 30 minutes to get involved. Yeah. And just to tie up uh, a couple of more loose ends. Uh, we mentioned that Steve Austin apparently said no. And we talked about this off the air. We don't think we slash I don't think that like there's heat or anything between Austin and The Rock. Mm hmm. But Austin had, did bury the WrestleMania in Dallas where The Rock showed up and lit his name on fire with a flamethrower <laughs> and uh, and went like 38 minutes mm -hmm. on on one of the first six hour WrestleManias. Uh, he was like, uh, no offense, Dwayne, love you, but uh, that was some bullshiggity. <laughs> And uh, well, it was also a show where like Steve got trotted out there with Foley and Sean to do like comedy with the New Day and tore his rotator cuff. Yes. <laughs> and then Dwayne gets an hour by himself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think Steve is like, OK, well, if you have the rock, you don't need me. And if you have me, I don't want the rock there. So let's just, uh, you know, it's best for everybody if we keep us all apart. Mm hmm. And that's his uh, that's his philosophy. And I can't say it's, he's wrong because it means a lot when he shows up, generally Agreed. speaking, except for that show he did during the pandemic, <laughs> which was just hilarious. So <laughs> that Becky buries in her book and then blames for getting pregnant. <laughs> I was not aware of that, <laughs> but that's funny. Um it's like yeah. I it's like I drank a lot of beer in the ring. They I was planning on going home. They said, hang out. We might need to send you out to save Steve. <laughs> they I hung out. They said, all right, Steve's dying out there because they gave Steve Austin cue cards to read. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, uh, I can't, she Becky's like, so, yeah, I went out there. I drank approximately 40 beers in the ring with Steve Austin. <laughs> I got absolutely hammered. I kicked Byron Saxton in the dick. <laughs> just like, then I went home and my husband and I were a little bit less careful than we usually are. Uh huh. <laughs> and I, and I, I woke up with child. <laughs> Damn. Damn. All this time. Damn. Oh. Steve Austin ruined that WrestleMania. Well, that the novel coronavirus. Yeah. Um, also, the Undertaker, uh, one one child from his first marriage, mm -hmm. which was the older son that I was thinking of. Uh, two daughters with yeah. uh, his second wife, which I was not aware of. Um, and then a daughter with Michelle McCool. 
and apparently they also adopted a child. Oh. Uh, um, which I also was not aware of. So. Well, point uh, being, Mark, Mark, Mead Mark is not in a position to uh, to turn down a payday. <laughs> yes. Uh, real estate Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Mark uh, the podcaster. Yeah. Uh, the problem when you're a podcaster, though, as we know, mm-hmm. <laughs> after 10 years of doing this, is that if you don't have a good memory and uh, you're not particularly interested in anything, uh, <laughs> it's this is this isn't the this isn't the uh, the format for you. Well, it's like, do you not? And it's also like, well, does he not have a good memory? Does he pretend he doesn't have a good memory because the story won't make him sound like a good person? Right. You know, there's is he worried that if he tells the truth, it will affect him being employed somewhere in the future? A lot of factors go into these uh, these ex wrestler podcasts or, or YouTube channels or whatever. Yeah. And he's definitely like he's a guy who can't bury anybody in WWE. Uh he just Ironically. can't he can't afford to. Right. All right. Uh Raw the next night we opened again with uh tr- oh okay yeah so Cody wins the title. He uh finishes the story and the first people he wants to celebrate are his family and also Bruce Pritchard and Triple H. <laughs> we got Bruce Pritchard and Triple H uh called out to uh to celebrate with uh teal margaret and uh the rest of the Rhodes family in the ring at the uh after the wrestlemania main event uh-huh furious i was furious you didn't want to see bruce pritchard at 11 o'clock on a sunday night no i don't i never want to see bruce pritchard all right ever and uh no i was just it was just so painfully obvious and look from a strategy standpoint, I understand why they want to be on camera and be name checked. Um, because, as mentioned, the company is the most financially successful it's ever been, and it the business feels hot and feels you know, and you want to be the guy <laughs> credited with that, especially in light of. If it if it remains murky at best on what you knew and when as related to various crimes that may have occurred over your tenure working for the company, uh, it's a lot easier to look the other way on a guy who's, you know, quote unquote, responsible for the hottest, hottest era in 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 almost 30 years the company has seen. So I get why it's happening, but as a general practice. Uh, seeing Bruce Pritchard and Paul Levesque and listening to various people talk about how they're uh, solely responsible for this this wonderful brand new era that we're in. Uh, dreadful. And uh, and Nick Khan got on camera too. He's he's understated. You know he's he's not a guy who likes the spotlight, but he you know, we got to see we got to see Uncle Nick and Cody exchange a, a big hug at the end of the show too. They had a big hug. They had an emotional moment where the expression on Nick Khan's face never changed and his cold, dark, expressionless eyes uh, looked like uh, two eight balls the entire time. Correct. Yeah. So, look, you had a great weekend. You took a victory lap. I get it. But I also hate it. <laughs> sure. Oh, and Stephanie. Raw. Uh, yeah, Stephanie was all over this weekend. Uh, Stephanie and Linda were at the Hall of Fame on Monday, or uh, Friday. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't need the Hall of Fame anymore, by the way. Uh, we at very least we don't need the Hall of Fame uh, on Friday nights at eleven o'clock, it, 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 almost one a.m. We don't we don't need that. Uh, Paul Heyman's speech I did think was the best. Uh, part of the weekend. I thought Paul's speech was tremendous. He swore. He 
was funny. He kissed Triple H and Stephanie's asses. Mm-hmm. Um, just tremendous. Stephanie wore her ECW Kangor, which is immediately, which was admittedly very funny. Yes. Uh, Stephanie and Hunter were just there like, what? We're together all the time. What? <laughs> Why is everybody so surprised that Steph's here? <laughs> it's like, well, the last we heard from Steph, she was getting like ankle surgery after breaking her ankle mm-hmm. uh, and uh, quitting the company as soon as her father returned for the second time in <laughs> six months. Right. You, you may remember that Stephanie and Paul and Nick Khan all voted against Vince returning. And then the darndest thing happened. They just uh, they just changed their minds about a week later, voted him back. And then Stephanie just, you know, she said she's having trouble staying up this late. And she went home. Yes. Yep. Yep. She went home and decided to get uh, ankle surgery right away. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So uh, Stephanie's back. She's back at the Hall of Fame just uh, as a smiling face. And here's uh, here's the conversation. Uh, I would uh, like to do a bit of uh, TWL theater here. Love I would like I would like uh, you to be Stephanie McMahon's plastic surgeon <laughs> surgeon. And I will play the part of Stephanie McMahon. OK, I'd like you to ask me uh, what I'm looking to have done and uh, what size. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Miss, 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 Mrs. McMahon. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> what, uh, what what would you say you're you're looking to accomplish with this surgery? And um, um, just just ballpark it for me. Uh, what? Uh, what what general size are you thinking? I'm trying to accomplish with this surgery women's empowerment <laughs> and a women's evolution and a diva's revolution <laughs> that became a women's evolution. <laughs> and I'm thinking double watermelon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Applauding, standing as I tweet. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, she. Uh... <laughs> so then she opened night two with just a welcome to the Paul of that era. Mm-hmm. And Triple I, she's like so great that she's back home, back in the fold. And then PW Insider on Monday was like, "Yeah, but she doesn't actually have any role in the company currently." <laughs> Yeah, she's not actually back back. She's just she's, like she's willing to be photographed in public with Paul Levesque again. It's apparently <laughs> where we are currently. When we need all hands on deck, she are uh, are are she are <laughs> she is two of the hands we can call on deck. Mm-hmm. Um, Shane's phone didn't ring surprisingly. Apparently not. Um, and then uh, Raw After Mania had a little bit of that old Raw After Mania flavor to it. Uh, in that uh, there were debuts. Uh, Roxanne Perez has been on SmackDown before, but she wrestled on Raw for the first time. She's the Mm -hmm. NXT Women's Champion. Uh, Ilya Dragunov is the NXT Men's Champion. He also made his Raw debut on the show. And uh, that's pretty much it for new talent. That's all I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also opened Raw with Triple H uh, talking about the new era. And then uh, Cody, we had a commercial free first hour. It felt like a commercial free first hour and a half. And uh, Cody came out and put over Triple H again and Triple H put over Cody and everybody loved everybody and the crowd trained for Paul Levesque. Mm -hmm. And uh, then The Rock showed up and The Rock and Cody had a really awkward segment. I saw somebody say on uh, Twitter that The Rock uh, speaks in the tone and cadence of a grizzled pervert (laughs) in this in this in this current iteration of his final <laughs> boss character and, and really that's the perfect way to describe it a grizzled pervert <laughs> is great. is the way that he the final boss character is carrying himself and and speaking and uh they pretty much agreed that uh rock's gone away to shoot some movies and uh that somewhere down the line he's coming back to uh to fight cody mm-hmm and he gave Cody something and said, don't break my heart again. 
and there's going to be so there's like a uh what do they call those element those things in MacGuffin in uh in storytelling where it's like oh pay attention to this Chekhov's, uh, Chekhov's gun Chekhov's gun yeah but um whatever the uh the deal is we're getting Cody and Rock somewhere, probably, possibly, unless Rock changes his mind again. <laughs> Always a possibility. Um, yeah, I thought maybe they would redo the thing with Cena and announce where it was happening, whether that was at SummerSlam or Mania next year or, I don't know, the first Netflix Raw, Raw yeah. or whatever. But Definitely had that feel to it. Like I thought they were gonna say, okay, one year from today the media event. Yeah. Yeah. But they chose uh chose not to. They left left it open. I guess maybe it will depend on whether or not uh, Dwayne's uh picks up other film uh uh requirements over the next year or so. So maybe it's up to him more than it is the company, so he didn't want to set a date yet. Maybe so. We know he's shooting two movies back to back right mm-hmm. now, but uh he was pretty insistent in all of the media he did, and he did do quite a lot of media. Sure did. Uh, uh, That's some really interesting it. things to say. <laughs> did he? Uh-huh. And you hear him go on Fox News and talk about woke culture? Oh, I did. I thought you were talking about wrestling interesting things. And oh, I was no, like, he, didn't I, say it. he didn't say anything. I mean, he did go on and lie and pretend that this was all his idea, but, <laughs> you know, you expected that. <laughs> Even though they're currently producing a documentary that they're going to put on Peacock or whatever about how everything blew up in their face over that week where they announced Brock and Roman and then realized the fans are going to be pissed off. Well, his timeline was a little skewed in in the uh, in that uh, in that ESPN piece where he was like, yeah, the fans were upset. So we decided to pivot there kind of in late January. And it's like, no, your timeline's off. Because uh, Cody won the <laughs> Royal Rumble. And uh, no reason to have him do that unless uh, he was going to... Anyway, regardless. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so The Rock is coming to uh, to fight Cody at some point. That'll be uh, a spectacle. It mm-hmm. definitely feels like the biggest match that, the, that they can do as a company right now. Absolutely. Um, it would be nice, I feel like, if um, we just... Uh, we even if it's just like a little promo or once in a while or or uh the rock having a minion attack uh cody i th- i would like Dwayne to have some kind of presence on the show sure. not all the time <laughs> but uh definitely not all the time well you could, you could get creative with it you could you know have him do the to the harley race he puts a bounty on cody and then you just constantly have people trying to jump Cody, and it's all at the behest of uh, Dwayne. The final boss. Yeah. Sure, why not? Um, yeah, so as we mentioned, uh, Jey Uso won the number one contendership after CM Punk screwed Drew McIntyre again on Raw. Mm-hmm. And that's about all there is coming out of Raw. Uh, Anything else WrestleMania weekend that you want to talk about? I know you watch Santa Deliver and have detailed thoughts on all seven matches from that show, but just in the interest of time. <laughs> well, no. the joke's on you because I did watch Stand and Deliver. Whoa! So, except no for, I think, the first two matches. I didn't watch the pre-show match, and I don't think I watched the tag team match, but I watched the rest of the show. Anything stand out to you as someone uh, who doesn't regularly view the product? I liked the Roxanne Tyra Valkyria match. Lyra. Yeah. Lyra. Sorry. Um, I liked that match a lot. Um, I think the NXT commentary team is the worst commentary team not involving Matt Stryker that I've ever heard. It's an all-time bad team. Um, just awful. But yeah, I thought uh, I didn't. Tony D and Ilya Dragunov don't feel like characters that should ever interact on a pro wrestling show. True. They're very um, different in tone. Yes. Yes. Um, and then I, I liked, I liked that the main event only went like 11 minutes. I felt like that really played to the strengths of both <laughs> guys. Well, and, trick, trick is still green as goose ass as the saying goes. Right. And uh, Carmelo isn't, uh, 
very good in my estimation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no real no. ring general in there. Yeah. And also it's weird. It's weird to have a heel that's like a foot and a half shorter than the, <laughs> than the baby face beating up the heel for a long period of time. But yes, good match. Uh, the, the big meaty man match was fun too. Although uh, that and the women's match had incredibly distracting branding all over it. There's fallout logos all over the mat and LEDs during the, I think that's during the women's match because they're doing spots on the floor and there's the cartoon fallout guy giving a thumbs up. I see on the, on the mat, which I was irritated by. And sure. then, uh, and then uh, the big, the big meaty man match was sponsored by knuckles from Sonic. So, oh, I thought you were just talking about like the, the anatomy, the human anatomy. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun little play play on that uh, words. It's, it's two things. It's, it's both the, the, uh, the knuckles being thrown in, in fists, uh, in this match, but also, it's a it's a wonderful variety show that's coming to the Paramount <laughs> Plus Network, uh, featuring the character Knuckles, voiced by Idris Elba. What do you? You feel like Idris Elba needs better uh, representation? Yes. <laughs> I feel like that guy should be James Bond, and mm-hmm. a much bigger movie star than he is. Agreed. <laughs> And he's doing the voice of one of the Sonic the Hedgehog characters. Yes. <laughs> and look, those voiceover gigs seem pretty, pretty chill. Oh, sure. So it's fine if you do that. But yes, his his live action career, like the heights of which are playing like. Tenth from the top in the Thor movies and being the villain in Dwayne's failed Fast and Furious spinoff. Yeah. And like uh, a comedy gig on The Office 15 years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think he has like yeah. a, a BBC show where he plays a detective. You know, they do like three episodes every 10 years. One of those shows. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that that sounds right. Still, uh, as with uh, Matt Fest version of the MLB Network, <laughs> I feel I could do a better job as the agent for... <laughs> For Mr. Alba, as uh, yeah, I could do a better job as an agent than his yeah. current agent is doing. Great. Anyway, that's my NXT standard deliver. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the fallout from standard deliver, by the way, was uh, Lyra's uh, friend turned on her. Tatum Paxley turned on Lyra. Uh, love me some Lyra. Uh, Roxanne's a heel, shouldn't be a heel. Uh, she's gonna wrestle, or she wrestled Natty on Tuesday's NXT. Um, they're doing a two week special in a couple of weeks, and Trick and Carmelo are going to finish their feud again <laughs> in a cage match. <laughs> and uh, Dragonov is defending the NXT title against Trick, uh, where if Trick loses. He has to leave NXT. Uh, and Ilya is already declared for the draft on Raw. So I think uh, in two weeks, I think Trick Williams is winning the NXT championship, which seems like a thing they should probably do. Yeah. I like and NXT is the, the big, the big green, greenhorn division right now. You got him, you got Obafemi. Yeah. Yeah. Both those guys are, um, are really good, super charismatic. Mm-hmm. I mean, should be booked like Goldberg. Uh, I mean, maybe he knows how to work and is just hiding it, but I also think maybe three minute matches for him just till the end of time would be a good thing to do. Yeah. I mean, as long as you're not like the guy in charge of the company, didn't <laughs> spend like a large portion of his life trying to do everything he could to prove that Goldberg wasn't, you know, couldn't actually work and wasn't over and you can't just have a guy who only wins three minute matches yeah that's fair that's a fair point uh, uh Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin won at the pay-per-view and then dropped the tag team titles on TV uh Braun's headed to the main roster and uh, Axiom and Nathan Fraser of tag champions and uh, we already covered the women's title the North American title yeah all right that's uh, uh that's NXT 
AEW. Boy, what a week. <laughs> so everybody's talking about, obviously, uh, they aired, they made the decision that they were going to air backstage footage of CM Punk and Jack Perry's altercation from All In last August, almost eight months ago. They revealed over the weekend on a taped collision show Mm -hmm. that aired that began airing at 11 30 p.m on saturday (laughs) they revealed that they are going that they were going to air the footage um this footage has been rumored to exist for a while we know it Mm -hmm. existed they were then insistent in follow-up interviews that uh, this was for storyline purposes. It was not a bait and switch. We're really going to show you the real footage of CM Punk and Jack Perry fighting backstage. And this is going to play into the current, the Young Bucks versus FTR program that we have running for our Dynasty pay-per-view, which is coming up here in uh, less than two weeks. Mm-hmm. They are the footage. I, it was a little bit of a uh, Rorschach test. <laughs> sure seems like everyone who had pre-existing strong opinions about that whole situation, uh, somehow the footage managed to confirm everyone's pre-existing biases. <laughs> well, so they have the young bucks who are heels introduced this footage. Mm-hmm. And they said, you know, this show all in, we wrestled. FTR on that show and uh, a, for a guy who's friends with FTR trying to make everything about him and uh, interrupted our pre-match prayer ritual <laughs> was the funny line I will admit yes and uh, and here's the footage and, uh, and it, by the way Jack Perry's a scapegoat in all this mm-hmm. I'm apparently forgetting I don't know anyway so then they show the footage which is like 48 seconds of Paul Punk uh, walking up to Jack Perry, getting in his personal space. While Jack Perry has his hands on his head, his own head, he's like <laughs> running his hands through his hair. Mm-hmm. Punk either. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills, but I see a shove. People are saying he swings <laughs> uh, at, at Mr. Perry. He shoves him. After getting in his personal space, he shoves him. And then, like, tries to front face lock him. And maybe briefly has a bad guillotine choke on him for a handful of seconds until Samoa Joe gets in there and breaks it up. And then Punk appears to go over to towards Tony Khan and is wildly gesturing towards Khan. And then, like, Jerry Lynn and Chris Hero pull Punk away. And Malachi Black like decides he's going to be Punk's best friend, or like decides, okay, well now I'm going to walk off with my guy because I don't want to be here. I want to get fired. And uh, Chris Hero looks like the most stressed man of all time. <laughs> like I don't know what the and then the Young Bucks come back and say, mm, look, look what this did. This ruined Jack Perry's career, and. Also, we're wrestling FTR on pay-per-view in two weeks. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I thought it was super low rent. I didn't think it made CM, made CM Punk look like a stable genius, but I also didn't feel like it made CM Punk look bad, which I think was their intent because they got big mad that he did an interview with Ariel Helwani last week and... Buried the company and buried Tony Khan. And Tony mm-hmm. got his underwear in a bunch and decided he was going to fire back with something that he thought made CM Punk look really bad. And I didn't think it made CM Punk look really bad. Uh, any thoughts on the whole, the idea, the execution, <laughs> the creative, the uh, the fallout? Okay. Uh, so this whole thing, like the whole segment they did and FTR's promo afterwards is like a real classic uh, deal, I feel, where the person in charge decides they're doing something. Right. And then 
everybody else has to work backwards from the point of doing the thing to figure out how to somehow make this make sense within yes. the context of the show. I so, agree wholeheartedly. So that's what happened. So their solution was to have the Bucks come out and say, this thing happened. Poor Jack Perry got scapegoated. He's our friend to lay the lay the foundation that Jack's going to come back at some point and be aligned with the Young Bucks. And also, that distracted us, and that's why we lost to FTR. So we're going to wrestle FTR at the pay-per-view, and we're going to win this time because we won't be distracted. Um, so given... <laughs> That your starting point is we're going to air this footage. They did their best. <laughs> Everyone involved did their best. <laughs> um, the assertion, as, uh, as, as Tony Khan did in his Sports Illustrated interview uh, uh, earlier in the day on Wednesday, um, where he claimed that this was, it was the right time to air the footage because it was going to play into the... Uh, into this Young Bucks uh, FTR match. Well, that's well, that's a lie. <laughs> you play, you wanted to play the footage, and then you concocted the reason behind it. So, um, yeah, this is that's what happened. Um, the footage itself, it's look if if Punk on the Ariel Hawani show portrayed himself as kind of calm and Jack being. The one saying, well, why don't you do something about it? And Punk just trying to defend himself. That's not what happened. <laughs> I mean, in the video, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, but at the same time, I don't I don't necessarily know. It's never really been in doubt that I remember that Punk initiated the physicality. <laughs> um, and also, you already fired him, right? Like, you, you th- this didn't change how i looked at punk who i look at as a very entertaining albeit unstable person (laughs) and i looked at that footage and went yeah i mean he's he's pretty animated and then he shoves the guy and then they scuffle for a second and he gets him in the headlock or the choke or whatever and then it's over (laughs) and and then he yes he goes over and yells at tony khan and and so it's just like footage itself was like yeah okay that's it maybe it was shorter than than people would expect because the actual like physical when physical contact is being made between Punk and Jack Perry is probably less than ten seconds altogether. Yeah. Um. So maybe that's like a little disappointing. Like you wanted something more dramatic, but I don't know. I I don't think it makes Punk look any better or worse than he looked coming in. So. If you love CM Punk and you hate AEW and you thought he was in the right, you probably still think that. And if you hate CM Punk and you're glad he's gone, you probably saw that footage and went, yep, look at what an asshole he is. I'm glad he's gone. Um, What it didn't do, despite Tony Khan's assertions, is make anyone care one iota more or less about the FDR versus Young Bucks uh, tag title match at the pay-per-view next week. Um, you you know what would maybe make me care is if those two teams were in the same room at, <laughs> at, at any given point, given that they're feuding over the championships. Sure, I mean, yeah, <laughs> FTR did just win the their spot this past uh, this true past Saturday at midnight. So true, um, but this yeah, this was the first show, and they the Young Bucks cut their promo backstage, and yes, then. FDR comes out, and then and that was the other part of it too. It's like you air this footage, thus prolonging this news cycle far past what I think it would have been. Because I think by the time WrestleMania was over, I didn't see people still talking about this until t- it was announced that they were going to air the footage. Yes. Um, so you've prolonged it, and then trying to, I guess, get ahead of that feeling that you know probably a lot of people backstage in that company in both companies and a lot of fans have you immediately have FTR come out and and head it off and go well we're just tired of talking about this why don't we just focus on what's going on here and you know you have Dax and and Cash name a bunch of current talent who are still working there and look at all these great wrestlers we have why don't we focus on them and you're like yeah why don't we <laughs> 
Why did we do that? <laughs> but but again, the heat is not on the young bucks for airing the footage. Like the, it's like, oh no, the company company the guy in charge of the company was mad, decided he was going to put this on his television, and we worked backwards from there to try to make it the least bit palatable. Um, so like I said, it was, it's, it's, it's a fun little bit of like the time capsule of that era of AEW <laughs> to have that footage. Like it was kind of fascinating in that sense. Um, but yeah, it changed anybody's mind. Didn't feel like it embarrassed anybody. And if you thought punk was justified for shoving and then, you know, scuffling with Jack Barry already. You still think that. And if you don't think he was justified, you still don't think that. So feels like we just we just spun our wheels. But it did have the bit where where Chris Hero looked like the most stressed man of, that has ever lived. And that was really funny. And so for that reason, I think it was a net positive. We came right out of that, which by the way, followed like a 25 minute uh rated our superstar Adam Copeland <laughs> match. And we came out of the Young Bucks segment then into a promo where Will Ospreay took a shot at Triple H, who had taken a veiled shot at him on the Pat McAfee show last Mm -hmm. week, implicating that certain unnamed free agents that he had tried to sign decided that they wanted to work an easier schedule than WWE offers, and he didn't think that he doesn't think that people who haven't made it to WWE or who aren't with WWE haven't reached the pinnacle of their profession yet and haven't reached a point in their career where they can say, I want to work an easier schedule. And he wants the very Republican grind mindset mm-hmm. type of person on his roster. Hey, that's his prerogative. Uh, I thought it was kind of low rent taking a shot like that. But, um, hey, it's a wrestling war, and it's like I'm not sure it's even registered as far as like the one of the ten worst things either side has done to one another. So then Osprey goes out on dynamite and says, "I'm going to fire back," talking about grind mindsets from someone who only got his position from grinding on the boss's daughter. Sure is rich. This is a good natured jab back just to remind you that uh, you don't throw rocks at an assassin with a machine gun, something along those lines. And then proceeds to talk about his match with Brian Danielson mm-hmm. on pay per view coming up in 10 days. Uh, I thought the first hour of Dynamite was like all time bad. <laughs> I thought it was an all time bad show, uh, giving me a long. Edge match. Edge was all blown up. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like I I think Adam and Beth Copeland, the people are good people. Mm. Uh, (laughs) I think Adam has learned to respect marriage vows. Sure. And uh, and I think Beth's a good person. So I like them as people. I don't need to see the radar superstar Adam Copeland wrestle anymore. And uh, he was blowed up. He did have a good finish for his match with Penta. But yep. the idea that this, this match slapped, this match cooked, well, this was cinema, whatever the children are saying these days. I strongly disagree with that. And then we went into a counterproductive Young Bucks segment and a counterproductive Will Ospreay segment. Hey, how about we have Will Ospreay and Brian Danielson in the same room at some point, given that they're feuding? I mean, I think they passed one another on the entrance way once or twice, but... Uh, why don't uh, they tell us why they're actually wrestling each other instead of having Will Osprey shoot it on Triple H? Apparently, that was Will's idea. I don't know. I think the, the company's trying to take heat off itself by letting us know that that was Will Osprey's idea. Uh, sure. I didn't think in a vacuum, him taking a shot at Triple H was in a vacuum. Totally fine. On that show, immediately following the, the Young Buck segment, I thought it was dreadful and contributed <laughs> to an extremely dreadful hour of AEW programming on Wednesday night. Uh, what do you think? I mean, I agree. I wouldn't do that back to back with another. 
I wouldn't spend that long talking about people that aren't in your company. Um, and to be fair, like I said, they, to the best of the Young Bucks and FDR's ability, they tried to make all of that BS about their World Tag Team Championship match at the pay-per-view. It just doesn't work because nobody, because everyone knows what it actually was. Uh, the Will thing, I, I don't know. It, like I said, it, it coming directly after the Punk stuff does feel like, oh man, wow, we spent like 25 minutes talking about WWE on this AEW show. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't need that in a in a bubble or vacuum, whatever. I'm fine with him taking shots I, uh, at anyone, uh, you know, especially, especially Triple H. Especially Triple H. <laughs> I would say there are other things you could probably hit Triple H on that are a little bit more modern than he, you know, he's only in power because he he banged the boss's daughter. Like that's very, uh, it's very old school, uh, very retro insult about Triple H. Um, maybe you could bring up his fascination with iron crosses next time um, or some other things. But anyway, I don't, I don't care that he took a shot. You know, that's, that felt like standard pro wrestling to me. Someone took a shot at him. He took a shot back and then he moved on to talking about his paper rematch. So I didn't have a problem with that at all. Other than that, it came directly after that young bucks and FTR stuff, which was all about, whether they tried to pretend it was otherwise, it was all about a guy who doesn't work for you anymore and works in WWE. So that's really my only complaint about that. The show itself, my other complaint, and this goes back, we talked about this a little bit last week. I don't know if we talked about it all on the air, but uh, they're really trying to hammer home, at least on social media, this catchphrase of uh, we're the best wrestle. Oh, yeah. Um, and I would love to see an example of that. <laughs> Because you think the radar superstar Adam Copeland burned the house down on one on Wednesday? Listen, the crowd was into that, and Penta worked very diligently to slow down. But no, I didn't think that. I liked uh, I liked Joe and and Dustin just fine, but again, not what I would consider a a barn burner television wrestling match. So I think again. I'm fine with all the BS and the hurt feelings and the airing dirty laundry on air. Cause it gives us something to talk about. It gives all of us something to tweet about. And it was fun examining that footage. Like it was this Bruder film. Don't get me wrong. Oh, without question. Uh, so by all means continue to do this. But if, if, but you're like, if it's me, if I'm running that company, I'm just putting on a bunch of kick-ass wrestling matches and trying to tell simple, easy to digest stories and try to be the alternative, the quote unquote challenger brand that you have claimed to be and stop trying to uh, whatever, what? you, whatever you've been trying to do, <laughs> whatever you've been doing for the last few weeks, stop it. <laughs> um, I don't, that's the thing. I, I don't know what they're doing other than acting out. <laughs> Yeah, like they were they, they, they feel like they got neg- hurt. Yeah, they got negative press and so we're using it to, stri- to strike back against the the quote unquote negative press and it's like whatever man. Like I said, I generally enjoyed Dynamite for the most part this year. There's always problems. We talk about them all every week on this show about things we like and don't like on Dynamite, but in general as far as the overall direction of the company, Joe is the world champion's been good. They've elevated Swerve Osprey coming in and becoming a pretty good promo, uh, you know, and and working fun television matches, good stuff. There's a lot of stuff to enjoy across AEW television, but the way they're putting it together these last few weeks uh, sucks. And also, when you add into the fact that you're trying to talk about how well, we, well we're the wrestling company, that's a classic. You know, TNA tried to do that. You know, even WCW to an extent tried to. You know, do that going back to you, know, you could find Jim Ross on like, you know, Saturday night talking about, you know, this is this is serious. These are serious athletes. This is real, real yeah. wrestling. We're not posing and listening to music like it's it's a tale as old as time for the for the other company to try to distinguish themselves. But like, then just do that. <laughs> yeah. And again, this is me offering you business advice. I'm totally OK if you decide to just devolve your show into 
trying to cl- to clap back at various people who work for WWE because it will give us something to talk about and laugh about. But it's not a particularly compelling show to watch as like a fan, <laughs> especially when you're supposed to be the alternative to the to the Gaga all talking show. Yes. Uh, they've announced their pay-per-view schedule for the rest of the year. They're running eight pay-per-views the rest of this year. There's one in April. There's one in May. There is one in June. There's none in July. Mm-hmm. There's one in August. There's one in se- a week later in September. There's <laughs> one in October. There's one in November. And there's one in December. So I think we are at, we're just about monthly. Uh, the rest of the year. And uh, I don't know what to make of that. I don't have any strong feelings on that one way or the other, other than I'm not a fan <laughs> of uh, of their pay-per-view wrestling. Uh, and uh, what did you think of uh, the reactions of Renee Paquette and Tony Schiavone uh, <laughs> playing the role? <laughs> there were a lot of avatars for me on this, sh- on this uh-huh. Dynamite show this week. You had Katsuyori Shibata playing the role of me in a backstage segment with Renee. Mm -hmm. We had Alex Marvez playing the role of me in a backstage segment with Mercedes Monet. And uh, we also had uh, Renee Paquette playing the part of me during the holding the microphone for Will Ospreay. And we had Tony Schiavone playing the part of me as they aired (laughs) the CM Punk footage. Uh, Any thoughts on uh, Punk or yeah, Punk, uh, Shivani and Renee? Uh, I thought maybe people were reading a little too much into the Shivani thing. <laughs> maybe I'm wrong, but he kind of always looks like that when they're like throwing to a heel promo, doesn't he? Like, uh, yeah, but also I got to, I was like, I want to play poker with that guy. Sure. <laughs> I, I, again, I, I think it's pretty clear. I mean, they he was asked to comment on punk because punk brought his name up and he shut it down. It's like it would be stupid for me to do that. I don't. I don't give a shit. Right. <laughs> Correct. And and then his boss made a different call. Yes. So I don't know. I didn't take this like people were like putting it side by side with like him at Bash at the Beach 2000. Which yeah. Look, maybe you can say this is 99 WCW. This is not. They've still got many more rungs to fall down if they if they're gonna hit. WCW 2000 levels but um that being said yes he was he you know he just had his stern like ugh, <laughs> gross <laughs> Renee looked like oh I might want to work there again someday and so <laughs> I need to make sure I'm not like overly enthusiastic about Will <laughs> well Will you know marrying Hunter yeah. yes like so I just I'm just gonna just gonna lean out a little bit. <laughs> I'm gonna register my displeasure. Yes, that's that's what that felt like to me. <laughs> uh, also, I need to know uh, your analysis of the Spruder film. Did you see CM Punk swing at Jack, or not? Did you see, or did you not see him swing on, at Jack on the first contact? At any point in the 48 seconds. Okay. So he, I think the first thing is a shove, 100. percent I agree. Um, and then there's the scuffle. And then like as they're pulled apart, he just kind of sticks his arm out again. And you could probably argue that that was an attempt to hit Jack Perry. Okay. But like he, he kind of flails his arm again. Maybe he was just flailing, trying to get free from Jerry Lynn or whoever was holding him back. Um, but he does definitely flail his arm in the direction of Jack Perry after they are pulled apart. So. Okay, but the first one, which seemed to be the one everyone was talking about, I thought, no, that's a shove. Okay, I agree. I wanted to make sure I'm not taking crazy pills. <laughs> it, look, I'm firmly in one camp over the other. <laughs> <laughs> firmly in one camp over the other, and it, it, therefore, it probably best if I just don't have any opinions on on the video. But uh, hey. There, there you have it. Maybe Phil exaggerated a little bit when he told his story to Ariel Helwani. And when he originally told the story through <laughs> Nick Hausman about how Jack Perry checked him and bumped him and came at him. 
that might have also yes. been a little, a little bit of a fib. But, Correct. you know, heat of the moment, you know, you don't always remember things perfectly. Not everyone has perfect recall. So sure. Just an innocent mistake. Yeah, definitely. All right, man. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Well, funny enough, Jack Perry's wrestling <laughs> in Chicago on Friday night. That's right. I forgot about this. Uh, New Japan, Windy City, right? It's easy to forget about New Japan these days. Sure is. They're running in the United States a Friday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time pay per view. What? You're running a pay per view up against the most watched wrestling show in the, in the country? That seems mm-hmm. dumb. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> also, you're running a show with AEW talent up against a. AEW at 10 p.m. Eastern? Yes. Well, that seems counterproductive. Yes, I agree. Okay. Well, (laughs) John Moxley's wrestling Tetsuya Naito for the IWGP world title on that show. Jack Perry is going to be on the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's in House of Torture, everyone's favorite faction. Everyone's favorite. Um, this doesn't a particularly uh, hot thing. Maybe because they uh, didn't know until six days before the show that Moxley was going to be challenging for the world title on the show. I hate how they book, how they promote, but it's how they promote, and it's not going to change. And uh, the business model, it's why their business model is stuck in 1972. And they really don't have any hope of um growing on an international basis uh because i think AEW is the number 2 now in the US and until they completely self destruct that is uh, not going to change so what else is going on in this show is uh Shota Umino is wrestling Jack Perry we already saw this match once in the New Japan Cup made more sense when they announced this as Jack's NJP, NG, NJPW debut made more sense uh, Naito versus Moxley, Dolph Ziggler versus Tomohiro Ishii, <laughs> fever dream match. Uh, Matt Riddle versus Zack Saber for the TV title. Um, Eddie Kingston and a crew versus Gabe Kidd and a crew. Hiromu Takahashi versus Mustafa Ali. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, yeah, a bunch of uh, other stuff on the undercard. Uh, I don't see this um, lighting the world on fire. As far as a Friday night, eight PM Eastern Time pay per view, but uh, John Moxley has John Moxley. Has, it, it, I mean, it's a it's a uh, better than average card, I would say. <laughs> and John Moxley has a strong and devoted fan base who maybe will pay the twenty bucks to see it. Yeah, I was going to say it's they have a pretty good size. I mean, for a New Japan and America show, it's a giant crowd. Um, yeah, they got like ten thousand or whatever in the whatever the building is in Chicago. Mm-hmm. So. You know, it'll be a big crowd. I'm sure it'll be a fine, enjoyable show, but I don't know. I guess you could do something shocking, like put the, IG, the IWGP title on Moxley, and then he loses it back to Naito at Forbidden Door or something, if you wanted to do that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, otherwise, I think it'll be it'll be a fine, wonderful variety show at 8 p.m. on a Friday night, head to head with SmackDown and then Rampage. Moxley uh, winning the title, like you would think, one of these times, you he probably shouldn't do a job in a, in in he doesn't do a lot of jobs and he shouldn't do a job in the United States, right? Uh, also, but also, I I mean, he could go over and drop it at Dominion, sure. Um, I I don't know what it does for their business. I mean, their business over the next couple of months they have Dantaku and then they have the Super Juniors. So if ever there was a time maybe to put it on a guy who's not in the country, maybe maybe it is the <laughs> next two months. Right. But uh yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Now is there anything else you want to talk about? No, I think that about wraps it up. All right, sounds good. So till next time everybody, uh I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. <laughs> Forgot who I was for a minute. <laughs> Uh, We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios.
Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. I don't know if it's a funny story. I have a story about how I was and then wasn't an M again going to Jackson Holiday's home debut on Friday. Okay. So, uh been uh was was uh, seeing a lady for a little while. And uh both- a lady you say. Correct. Uh yeah, flesh and blood, human being and uh female. And nice person. We were getting along, I thought, pretty well. And we both like uh, baseball, as it turns out. So after, I think last week was date number four, uh, she said, why don't, before we even knew it was Jackson Holiday's debut, she's like, do you want to go to the Oriole game next weekend on Friday night? I was like, yeah, sure. So, um, and we had had a conversation previously about like, what did we both want out of this? Uh, and I was like, you know, I'd like to find something long term, but I try not to put a lot of pressure on that right out of the gate. So let's just hang out and see if we like each other, <laughs> which I think is a reasonable thing. Um, but it became increasingly clear this week that she was really into it and I was lukewarm on it. And but I knew I had this game on Friday (laughs) and then uh, Jackson holiday got called up number one prospect in all of baseball. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to go to this home debut. And I'm like, I know I can see this conversation is coming, but I was like, what if I just deflect until after the game on Friday? And then we can have this conversation. And pray she doesn't have the internet. Correct. (laughs) Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be telling the story if we hadn't. Already... She, she's not a listener. No, and she did. She did like wrestling too, um, or used to like it. Anyway, At past tense. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, it, so I was like, we can just make it through, and then we'll just we'll check in, see where we both are after the weekend, and then this afternoon she was like, "What are we doing?" because this other person asked her out and she wanted to turn him down because she wanted us to be exclusive. And I thought about just saying, sure, because I'm not currently seeing anyone else. It's very tiring dating one person. I don't really, I don't have that dog in me to be dating two (laughs) people at once. Uh, it's, It's very tiring, honestly. Um, but so I was like, but I didn't, but I was pretty sure this was not going to be like a serious thing. And so against my wanting to go see Jackson Holiday, uh, Major League or Camden Yards debut, I told the truth <laughs> and said, ah, I, I, I don't think this is, uh, I was like, I was like, I'm happy to keep hanging out for a little while. Uh, but in the interest of not like being disrespectful or lying to you, I don't see this becoming like a full time committed thing. But you know, we can still we can still hang out. And she said, "Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't think we should see each other anymore." I was like, "If if we're on the if we're on different pages, nice. Yeah, makes sense." And the thing is that she had bought the tickets to the game. Oh, bummer. So I was like, so my initial reaction after I saw that, like, I, we shouldn't see each other anymore was not like, oh, that's a bummer. Cause you know, I liked her. She was a nice person and we got along well. My immediate reaction was, damn, I really wanted to go to that game. And so then I bought tickets and me and my friend are going. So <laughs> Uh, had a happy ending, I think, if you really <laughs> consider uh, my narrative in this story. Unless you love love. Yes. 
in which case it's say you could say it's bittersweet but uh, overall i think it i think everything worked out pretty well <laughs> and where <laughs> i am absolutely helpless <laughs> yeah probably <laughs> I don't know. I don't want. I don't want to waste anyone's time. <laughs> All right. Well, please do share more stories from your personal life, which I know nothing about, despite <laughs> knowing you for thirty-one years. Well, it's just most of them aren't that interesting, you know. <laughs> most times, like, oh, you met a girl. She was nice. We went on one or two dates, and then one of us stopped responding to the other one's messages. You know, like. Sure. Or we both didn't, or we came to the end of whatever conversation we were having, and neither one of us started a new conversation. Not necessarily like one person ignored the other, but like, oh, we both just kind of left each other on red for <laughs> the rest of time. So <laughs> like, those aren't interesting stories to tell on a podcast or in in general. But this one, I was like, well, this is funny because I like genuinely considered lying to this person and being like, yeah, let's. Let's be boyfriend and girlfriend so that I could go to Jackson Holiday's home debut for free. And then I thought that was probably a bad thing to do, so I shouldn't do that. This is uh this is uh this is a very much a Seinfeld plot, by the way. <laughs> it did feel sitcom. It did feel it did ring as 90s sitcom to me when, when it was happening. Yeah. Well th- 30 years ago sitcom plots like that had it been on television which is one right. reason Seinfeld was groundbreaking makes sense <laughs> I try to keep on keeping on 